Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. OK, so let's get started. The next uh, speaker is Dr. Jeanette Wing. Um, her background is in security. and. In fact, she was on the board of the Trustworthy Computing Initiative. But more recently, some of the things that she'll be talking about is going to be very, very important to all of you who are, I'm sure, after this, going to go run startups. And that will hopefully grow into big companies. And you will need to know how to influence large groups of people. And so uh, Dr. Wing leads Microsoft Research Labs. And she is sort of my boss's boss's name. Um, one of the things that uh, is, is amazing about her is how she's able to uh, influence this group of people into making big, bold beds, going forward, doing research. Um, a little known fact about her that also helps is that she's a black belt in karate. So with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Wing. So good afternoon. I hope you all had a good lunch. I am going to talk about computational thinking. and. Um, I have a grand vision for the world. My grand vision is that computational thinking will be a fundamental skill used by everyone by the middle of this century. This vision of mine is um, pretty bold in the sense that I think everyone will be thinking computationally um, as a fundamental skill, just as they know how to read, write, and do arithmetic. Um, of course, this vision of mine is incestuous in that it will be computing and computers that will spread the, um, pro the use of computational thinking. This vision of mine also has implications with respect to research, research in any discipline, whether it's a science or an engineering discipline or humanities, arts, and so on. And in fact, for the first part of my talk, I'm going to try to convince you that computational thinking has already influenced the research discipline, the research thinking of these many other disciplines, from the science and engineering fields all the way to the arts and humanities. But this vision of mine also has implications with respect to education. If I indeed feel that every single person should know how to think computationally, um, one can argue that, well, maybe we should be teaching computational thinking or computer science or some notions of computing at early grades, early ages, K through 12. Not wait to teach computer science um, till you reach college or when you go to graduate school. So I'm going to save a few minutes at the end of my talk to t tell you about how much progress has been made around the world in teaching computational thinking at the K through 12 level. And um, also at the undergraduate level. Many years ago, I wrote a three-page article called Computational Thinking. And I encourage all of you to read it. It's very easy to read. It's a little poetic. It's one of those reads that you uh, do right before you go to bed. So it's not deep reading. So I, I hope you uh, go home tonight and, and read my Computational Thinking paper. Before I talk about um, the influence of computational thinking in research and education today. Let me start by trying to phrase what I mean by computational thinking. Now, this phrasing of it is a little technical. Um, computer scientists would appreciate some of the words I use in this definition, and I'll walk you through it. By computational thinking, I mean the thought processes. So it's thinking. It, it was, it's what you do in your head. It's what you do in your head, thought processes. It's not what you type at the computer, because already you've done something in your head. Computational thinking are the thought processes involved in formulating a problem and expressing its solution or solutions in such a way that a computer, and a computer could be a machine or it could be a human, because after all, humans compute. And more interestingly, a computer can be networks of humans and machines working together to solve problems that neither can solve alone. 
So the thought processes involved in formulating a problem and expressing a solution, its solution, in such a way that a computer can effectively carry out. So a couple of the key words in this definition are expressing. The word expressing is key because it underlies all the th theory and practice of programming languages and specification languages that we know and study in computer science. Effectively is very key to this definition because we want solutions that are efficient, that you can actually run on a machine and they'll finish in time. And so effectively is not any old solution. It's got to be something that a human or a machine can actually execute. So I'm not going to belabor that definition, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what I mean by computational thinking. Um, more abstractly, I like to think about the most important thought process that we learn as computer scientists, that we practice as computer scientists on a daily basis, is abstraction. That's when you have a, a large system that's quite complex underneath, and you're trying to just understand um, a, a model of it, for instance, that's what Jennifer uses, the, modeling this complex behavior using some abstraction. So the process of abstraction is ignoring irrelevant detail in the large complex ma uh, mess in the bottom and defining a model, or an elegant, um, usually in mathematics, a, a mathematical model, so that you can reason about what you care about in terms of this model, in terms of the abstraction. So what we do in computer science all the time is the process of abstraction, the process of defining these models so that we can do better reasoning. So that's just an example of a kind of thought process. Um, and there are many instances of these abstractions. Um, so computational thinking philosophically, it's actually the way, another way to think about it, is that it combines mathematical thinking and engineering thinking. It's certainly um, related to mathematical thinking because computer science, the science of computer science, um, is defined in terms of mathematics. So the underlying foundations, theoretical foundations of computer science um, is mathematics. And so it's no wonder that there's mathematical thinking in computational thinking. Um, but the difference between pure mathematical thinking and compu computational thinking is that when we execute our solutions or effectively carry out our solutions on a machine or as a human, we are constrained by the physics, the actual physics of the machine. We can't represent, um, we can't um, reason about all uh, integers because we're only representing a finite number of them in our machine for example. Um, oh. Computational thinking also draws on engineering thinking because, in fact, when you're building a system, a computer program, you're writing a program and you're building a system, you're engineering an artifact. And so you want to borrow from all the discipline um, of engineering that we know when you design, you build, you test, you verify, and you iterate. All of that engineering methodology goes into the way in which we build software systems, hardware systems. So there's definitely some engineering thinking that goes on in computational thinking. But there's one difference between traditional engineering thinking and computational thinking. And that one difference is because of the one difference between computer science and all engi other engineering disciplines. If I were to have an interactive um, lecture with you, I would start asking the audience questions, like what one thing might that be? But I'll just ask, what one thing might that be? And answer it myself. <laughs> so what one thing might that be? It's software. Because in software, you can do anything. You can build worlds, virtual worlds, that defy the laws of nature, defy the laws of physics. Because it's a virtual world, you can invent your rules. 
And you know this from games where avatars die and come back alive, or, or they fly around, and, and, and so on. So in, computa in computer science, um, because of software where you can invent anything, um, you're not constrained by the physical world the way you are in, say, civil engineering, where your bridge has actually got to stand up and it can't fall down, and similarly with the buildings and so on. So you could imagine in computer science being completely immersed uh, in, in the virtual world and ignoring the physical world. Of course, today, um, there's, there's an emerging area of what I call cyber-physical systems, which combines regular engineering thinking with computational thinking. OK, so when I talk about computational thinking, I actually am talking about the abstractions. I'm not fixated on the artifacts that we produce. And I do believe that it's something for everyone everywhere. So just to be a little concrete, I just have a list here of other kinds of comp uh, computer science concepts or abstractions that we use as computer scientists on a daily basis. I'm not saying that everyone should learn all of these, but everyone can learn a few of these, like what an algorithm is or what a state machine is. But the reason I list these abstractions here, these concepts here, is to contrast what I mean by computational thinking from computer literacy. I don't mean everyone in the world by the middle of the 21st century should know how to use Excel and Word, although that probably will be true. Um, I don't mean that everyone in the world by the middle of the 21st century will learn how to program in Java or Python or whatever the favorite language of the year is. Of course, computer programming, um, as Ed Lazowska mentioned this morning, is an important skill that um, helps you learn the concepts of computational thinking. So along the way of learning computer science, you learn how to program. Much like along the way of becoming a mathematician, you learn how to prove theorems. So now let me talk about how computational thinking has already influenced the research approach, the research methodologies of other disciplines. And let me start with one discipline that's been influenced already by many different computational methods. So again, in my interactive um, mode, I would ask the audience, what one discipline might that be? And I'll say, well, what one discipline might that be? <laughs> and Anadan will say, biology. And I think it was in the... Um, triggering event of the sequencing of the human genome, when the biology uh, community woke up and said, you know, maybe those computer scientists have something to add to my repertoire of thinking skills. Because it was the shotgun algorithm, an algorithm that expedited the sequencing of the human genome. Of course, there was a lot of compute infrastructure that went along with that. But I think it was that time, that point in time, when biologists and computer scientists started talking to each other. And now we have departments and programs and degrees and courses on computational biology. So it's a completely new field as blended from computer science and biology. And the many examples that I list here are really different computational methods or tools or languages or techniques used to understand and discover new biology. What's common to these models and languages for representing, uh, what's common to these models and languages is that they are all ways to express the dynamics of um, interacting complex processes. Because actually, if you look at nature, it's just these complex processes that interact with each other. They're information processing agents that communicate with each other. Um, and of course, in computer science, we know how to do that because, after all, what's an operating system? It's just a lot of concurrent processes trying to coordinate and synchronize with each other to get the job done. 
So we have many models and languages and reasoning systems um, to explain how these concurrent processes interact, to explain how um, they should behave or how they should not behave. So it's natural for computer scientists to think maybe the models that we use for understanding concurrent processes or distributed systems are, would be appropriate for modeling and then understanding the dynamics of biological processes. So let me give you one example, and this actually comes from research at Microsoft Research. Actually, there are two parts to this um, um, story. The first part is simply a theorem prover that was built at Microsoft Research. Um, this theorem prover is called Z3. It is the world's best theorem prover. Um, and what, I, what do I mean by a theorem prover? If you consider this formula, b plus 2 equals c and f of so on, it's just a formula. And the question is, does this formula, um, is it satisfiable modulo some theory t? And you'll notice in this formula, I have a mix of theories. The first part, b plus 2 equals c, is probably something about integers. The second part, read of right of a, b3, it's probably something about arrays. So I need some theory to reason about arrays. Um, and the last part um, is also about integers and possibly, with the f's on both sides, uninterpreted function symbols. So Z3 is a satisfiability modulo theories solver, SMT solver, because it knows how to reason about lots of different theories, integers, arrays, uninterpreted function symbols, and so on. Very powerful. You can throw a whole bunch of long formulas at it, and it can, find, it can answer this question. It can answer, does this, when I ask the question, does this formula, is it for, formula satisfiable, I mean, um, does, it, does it fall in the blue region or outside of the blue region? And the blue region gives me an assignment to all the variables in that formula that make it, come, that make it true. So this is a long-winded way to say, we've been doing research in this area of verification and programming languages and formal methods and applying to all sorts of systems at Microsoft Research um, for many years, many years. Um, in fact, the person who was sitting in the middle of the panel, Sri Ram Rajamani, has done work in exactly using this kind of system. So this is bread and butter computer science. What does it have to do with biology? That's what I'm going to tell you. So now, take your computer science hat off and put your biology hat on. And I'm going to tell you about another piece of work also done at Microsoft Research um, in our Cambridge lab in UK on stem cell prediction. The setup is the following. Um, we know some things about embryonic stem cells, and we don't know other things. So we'd like to learn more. In particular, we know that embryonic stem cells have two interesting properties. One is that they're self-renewing, which means they divide indefinitely. The other is this notion of pluripotency, which means a single stem cell can turn into some kind of differentiated adult cell, like a kidney cell or a skin cell or a brain cell. We don't know how that process works, but we, knew, no, we do know that, that it happens. And so that's the new biology that we'd like to understand. How is it that stem cells, stem cells turn into whatever they turn into? And what's so exciting about this is the biologists know that if they take an adult cell, they actually know how to reprogram the adult cell to turn into a stem cell. So with that, you can imagine if we can steer a stem cell in a way to become a kidney cell or a skin cell, then we have a way of tackling many diseases, many possible um, organs, uh, 
and so on. So this is the tantalizing part of the story. We don't know how to do that. We don't even understand how they work. So this work was, was partly to understand um, uh, embryonic stem cells. So what we do know is that if you have a, an embryonic stem cell, and there are three kinds of signals that it can re react to. In fact, only two out of three of those signals um, help uh, 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 determine um, the, the kind of the next state of that stem cell. These signals are, are LIF, Chiron, and PD. So what you can do is you can express the key genes under different combinations of these three signals to see whether there's um, a, a positive interaction between, the two, between two genes or a negative uh, inhibitory uh, re, uh, relationship. And so you can actually express that, that heat map, if you will, in terms of a graph. This goes back to Jennifer and her graphs. Uh, or a state machine. You can think of the blue nodes as the blue nodes re representing the genes and simply think of them as states. And the black nodes are signals into the state machine. And the blue arrows represent a positive interaction between two genes, given whatever input signals there are. And the red arrows represent some inhibitory relationship. And then, as a computer scientist, you look at that and you see a graph or you see a state machine. And then all of a sudden, all the tools that we know how to reason about dynamics of concurrent processes or um, graph-like structures come to play. And so what the computer science biologists did was use Z3, that theorem prover that I talked about earlier, to encode this state machine, encode this graph. Um, but the problem is there are basically 10 to the 43 possible Boolean networks represented by this little diagram. And you can't possibly analyze each one. But what you can do is you can constrain the, out of the possible Boolean networks, you constrain the ones that are interesting to look at by using experimental evidence. So that's what she did. She basically you know, fed this graph into Z3, added the constraints representing experimental uh, observations from real experiments, and then she was able to, to extract a minimal uh, state machine that represents um, uh, the, the minimal set required to explain, explain stem cell behavior. So this is, you can think of the kernel or the essential program uh, that governs pluripotency. So this was the breakthrough science. Because she was able to feed this left-hand side graph into this theorem prover and uh, determine the right-hand side based on experimental evidence, um, she discovered new biology. And that paper appeared in Science. So that was my story with two Microsoft research um, stories to uh, back up. Uh, the point being that there are off-the-shelf computational methods, tools, and techniques that can be used in the repertoire of tools that biologists might want to use to discover new biology. So now let me turn it around. I was really arguing that there's one science, I picked on biology, that has been influenced by many methods, and I picked on one method um, because I'm familiar with it. But let me flip it around and say, what one method in computer science has had influence on many different dis disciplines? That's a, that's a question. <laughs> Anyone want to guess? Machine learning. So that's pretty obvious these days. Um, and the, so machine learning or the use of large amounts of data uh, to analyze and find patterns and classify and so on 
is prevalently used um, in the sciences, uh, in astronomy, in medicine, meteorology, in the neurosciences. And it's also used um, beyond the sciences. It's used for detecting fraud in credit card usage. It's used in recommendation systems, um, reputation services. It's use, even used in um, analyzing sports, um, the, the players, uh, analyzing all the videos of professional players so that maybe uh, coaches can train off of those professional players for the high school or college teams. So the one story I want to tell, it's a Microsoft research story um, that's related to machine learning, actually goes back to the introduction that Sycott gave of uh, Raj Reddy. And it has to do with this breakthrough um, that happened in speech recognition. So up until basically 2009, um, we were able to uh, recognize uh, the word error rate in recognizing speech was on the order of um, 30 percent. So roughly speaking, you know, every third word that I'd say would be wrong, that would, the machine would not recognize properly. And then in 2009, there was a dramatic improvement in word error recognition rate down to the basically one every, say, one every sixth word. And what that improvement came from was this notion of deep neural networks. And Chris Bishop, the person sitting here at the panel, um, talked about in his own career of inventing and uh, using deep neural networks for fusion. I hadn't known that story. Well, here we are um, in 2009 using a, a, a newer version of deep neural networks that helps us do speech recognition. And so, and, and a lot of this work was very fundamental science. Um, after decades of work in speech recognition, a field that I like to think Raj Reddy actually started. Um, and so in 2012, in Tianjin, China, um, my former boss um, gave a speech. He spoke English. And the speech recognition system was good enough then to, in real time, recognize his speech, then tra um, transliterate it into English text. And then that was um, immediately translated into Chinese. And then the Chinese speech came out of a synthesizer um, that was based on his um, kind of voice. And so this was a demo. This was truly just a demo um, of how good speech recognition had become after so many years of poor word error rates. And it was an astounding demo. Uh, many of us in the front row were at that demo in 2012. And it was really a breakthrough result. Um, so since this demo, Microsoft has taken it one step further. And we now previewed in December of last year in Skype a system called Skype Translator, which allows speakers um, in English and Spanish to talk via Skype and communicate with each other in real time. And so we have, there's a, a, a young girl from the United States here on the left and a young girl from Mexico on the right, and they have a conversation together about um, where they live and what they like to do. And this is happening in Skype in real time. And you, they, they can actually see the translation of what the other is saying in this um, script right here. Phenomenal progress taking from a demo to actually a real system. And so we will see, I hope in the, this coming year, more languages supported. So that's machine learning, um, specifically deep neural networks as one kind of machine learning technique that has transformed society 
this speech translation system that I just talked about addresses what Raj Reddy was asking for this morning, breaking down the language barriers. And so we're getting there. Um, it's not so easy. It, it wasn't so easy to do just the two languages. <laughs> Raj knows this. OK. So <laughs> computational thinking and other sciences I'll go through quickly. Uh, chemistry, physics, geosciences, we have many examples. Computational thinking for society. One of the most exciting um, emerging areas in computer science and at Microsoft Research today is the combination of computer science and economics, um, and also computer science and the social sciences. Um, the one I wanted to talk to you about is how computational thinking can actually help in healthcare. And I want to bring this back home to India. So in India, tuberculosis is a really um, tough problem to solve. As the car was taking me over today, I noticed something like a National Tuberculosis Institute that I passed. It's, uh, really, it hits you hard. The problem with um, uh, treating tuberculosis is that um, it's, it's hard to make sure that the patients actually take their medication. So you'd like a way to uh, uh, have the patient, ha let the doctors um, ensure that patients are complying with the treatment, taking their medication, and so on. And you can't have the patients, you know, go to some central location and, you know, have the doctor administer the medication or make sure that the patient is taking because that takes a long time. It might be uh, really hard for the person to travel. Um, if you have to travel, then you miss work. It's just not a reasonable way to do the compliance checking. So what a group at the Microsoft Research India Lab came up with is a system called 99 Dots. And it's so simple. And it uses mobile technology. And basically, the, the doctor will put in this kind of blister pack all the eight pills, for instance, this one will fit eight pills, and then seal it. And then the patient will have received, say, from the pharmacy, a box of these blister packs all lined up, all numbered in a particular way. And say the patient takes the first blister pack, and then the first treatment is to take four pills. So you pop four pills out. And then you'll see on the back of each of the, um, for each of the pills, uh, covers, is a number. And so what the patient then does is it calls this toll-free number, um, filling in the last four digits. And that authenticates with some server and some doctor that the patient has taken these four pills. And so what's interesting also about this um, design of the system is that um, it, the, the, the call is actually a missed call. And so it's free for the caller. And this is an example of really taking into consideration the local region um, when you're designing these sort of low-cost computational methods to help patient health care um, in, say, rural India. And so um, they're able to use servers to real-time track patients at scale. And right now, it's been tested at four sites in India. Um, and there's a, a, a grander scheme use, um, with uh, foundation money and NGO money to scale it out. So computational thinking. Um, I already said is used in sciences and for society and so on. Um, it's, it's everywhere you go, in, at least in the United States, you see new programs coming up like digital archaeology or digital journalism or digital humanities. And so these are all, this is all evidence that computational thinking is entering the thinking of these fields. What I wanted to do is very short um, example of how even in daily life you can be thinking computationally. 
So here's my example. I'm getting morning coffee from the cafeteria. And this is a real, real example. So here I am. And I get my cup. And then I put some milk in it. And then I get some coffee. I put some sugar in it. Then I pick up a lid. And then I get a napkin. And I leave. So, so as a computational thinker, I say, what's wrong with this picture? Um, you know, this is my path. And it's even worse if there's someone in your way because, you know, you want to get your lid and he's getting his cup. So as a computational thinker, uh, what do you think? So uh, this, again, in the interactive m version of my lecture, I would ask an audience member. Um, I would think pipelining. So then you would think, actually, how would I affect the most efficient pipeline? Or I might think, what are the minimum number of stations I need to move to affect a pipeline, and so on and so forth. Well, I've given you some time to think about it. If you just move the lids over, then you can affect a pipeline. It's not the most efficient, but at least you minimize the number of stations to move. OK, so I wanted to save some time to talk about how my vision on computational thinking for everyone has already made inroads in changing curricula at the national level around the world. It's not quite hit the US at a national scale in terms of curricula changes, but it has hit um, in terms of many, many different organizations. Uh, in the US, there's always lots of decentralized and uh, uncoordinated ways that education changes. Um, but I will point to code.org, which was mentioned already by Ed Lazowska this morning, as one of the recent influential mechanisms that we are reaching K through 12 students um, to teach them computer science, to teach them computer programming. And it's quite um, a, a recent wave of really reaching lots and lots of students. The UK is probably the country that is most ahead of everyone else in the world. And I really credit um, some of the individuals, for instance, Simon Payton Jones of Microsoft Research Cambridge, of being one of the leaders, the passionate leaders, to affect this change in the UK. So currently, this past fall, actually, um, the United Kingdom mandated from the Ministry of Education all the way down that some sort of computational thinking or computer science concepts be taught at every single grade level from K through 12. This is a remarkable policy achievement, if you think about it. And uh, it's going hog wild right now in the UK in terms of many, many organizations really jumping on um, to see how they can, uh, uh, they can make sure that every school child gets exposed to computational concepts. In China, uh, thanks to some of the efforts at Microsoft Research Asia, we're also starting to see um, changes at the college level in terms of curriculum where the point is to make sure that every college student um, would have access to some computer science course, major or non-major. And so um, I wanted to close, of course, with what's going on in India. And I understand that almost all of you in the audience have been touched by massively empowered classrooms. How many of you have uh, interacted with Max? That's quite impressive. Um, so I don't even need to tell you what it is, um, but I can share with you how far it's gone. Um, and so my understanding is that the blue regions are where MEC already is, and the green regions of India is where MEC hopes to be. And I'm not going to say anything more about MEC, because the talk after me is all about MEC. So I will close then and say that my three-page article has been translated into Chinese and French. And someone from Japan just sent me a version that will be published soon. And someone in Korea is working on a Korean version. So um, let me close by just saying, help me spread the word. 
help me make computational thinking commonplace. Thank you.